it was inspired by um, there's a, there was a real robot called Eric who was built in the 1920s. He wasn't really a robot; he was kind of an automaton, but he was incredibly famous. Um, he could stand up and he made a speech and um, he was built to replace the Duke of York who failed to turn up to uh, the opening of a science fair and he was immensely impressive, sparks came out of his eyes and everyone wanted to meet him and he toured the world and there was an interview with him in the New York Times and then he vanished. So the book is like kind of trying to imagine what happened to Eric, where did he end up and why did he disappear. Should you judge a book by a cover? Oscar Wilde said you should always judge a book by its cover. Um, well, you can certainly judge mine by my covers because Steve Lenton's covers are brilliant. I don't deserve them. Um, yeah, I think they're wonderful covers. I really like them. So, uh, I was kind of obsessed with Laika, who is the first creature from this planet to go into space, the first to see the world as and in the curvature of the world, uh, and who, you know, who sadly died. And I've always found that quite hard that she died. So try to imagine a happier ending for Laika where, I've, I always think if she met, if Laika had met aliens, um, and aliens found a little dog in a spaceship, they would assume the dog built the spaceship, they would assume that dogs were the dominant species on the planet, and they would be right, you know, dogs, humans are just there to feed dogs and throw things for them to fetch and clean up their poo after them. And there's something really moving about those Soviet space dogs, there were lots of them and they, they tried lots of rockets and they were all female, they were all stray dogs uh, because the scientists thought that stray dogs would have the kind of endurance skills to deal with the, the extremity of space. So there's something sad and, and wistful and at the same time quite funny about these ragamuffin runaway dogs in this amazing rocket. I, I really like to, to base stories on sort of the, the little gaps in, in history and reality, like if you can imagine Diagon Alley in London, you know, there is a Diagon Alley, there's this kind of magic street that's just off a real street, so I, lo I love to look for sort of gaps in the story of like what really happened to Laika or what really happened to Eric and kind of to make up something that fits in there. I definitely only work on one book at, this, at a time. I find writing quite difficult and it's quite a slow process for me. And but what does happen is that I think if you're working on a book for a long time, lots of different ideas come into it. Uh, so afterwards I read it and think, oh, that could have been a separate book really. But it's good that it's just a, a gag or a, a chapter in, in a different book. I kind of fall in love with quite a lot of my characters. I really love Minnie, who's a character in Framed, who's the, the little sister in Framed, who's the sort of, she's an aficionado of crime, and she, it's sort of her who encourages her brother to go and steal the world's most expensive painting, and he kind of comes to rely on her and says, so what do we do with it now? And she goes, well, I don't know, I'm, I'm a little girl. Oh. <laughs> you know? I kind of love the, the cheek of her and the creativity of her. I do remember learning to read. I learned to read in school using the wide range readers and I was really slow, which I now realise that I now know that was because I was like very young in my year, but I found it a real, real struggle and I kind of thirsted to read the better books that were further up the tree because I could see other kids reading better books. So re learning to read I remember very well as a kind of painful process to be honest with you. The first books that I kind of independently read were, I was given a big encyclopedia of animals and it was published by Paul Hamlin. I'd love to get another copy of it. And what was magical about it was that the paper was really thin. I guess it was quite a cheap book. It had these fantastic papers, uh, pictures in it. But because the paper was really thin, you would kind of constantly turn over several pages at once without knowing it. So for months and months and months I could go through this book finding new pages that I'd never seen. Go, oh, I didn't know about the bandicoot, nobody mentioned that before. <laughs> it was fantastic. Um, and that was really kind of enchanting and magical. And then from the point of view of story, I, I guess I really, the, the first sort of book that, that really possessed me and that I felt I really possessed it was The Wizard of Earthsea 
by um, Esther Le Guin, which I must have been quite grown up for, but um, I loved that book and everything about it, the fonts, everything. My childhood reading completely informs everything I am as an adult, not, not just as an author, but as a human being, because I think the thing I took from my childhood reading, which I would really love to think that I was giving on to other people, is an awareness of small pleasures that I think loads of children's books are really brilliant at, I guess because the free sex, so food is big in them and things like that. Um, like the food in the Narnia books or in the William books, um, the kind of those that kind of awareness of the little joys of life that will get you through the worst times, and in particular that's true of the Moomin books, which uh, the Moomin books are about a big family who are all different species and they hibernate and they all have, eat different food and the hero is Moomin Mama. I've got a big family. When they were teenagers, they all hibernated. They all had different food. Um, and but you, I was really aware at the table of the pleasure of just being in that group of people, and, and that this thing that might seem like a hassle was actually a joy. And I think I got that from Tuva Janssen as much as from anywhere else. And I'll never stop thanking her for that. I mean, I, mean, I write films and books, and I love. I still love writing films. It's very hard to balance the way the two work together in, w in my working life. But I, as an audience, like kids, I don't know, it's, it's a thing, isn't it? Like a really good film of a book can kill a book. Like I don't think anybody reads Mary Poppins anymore because the film was quite good, was sort of good enough. Whereas I think if a film flops, then the book can still live a little bit. Um, and it's, I don't know, it's, it's such a lot to think about. I think it's kind of interesting when you go to a school where they, I hate it when you go to a school where they're using a book, a film, to accelerate kids through the reading of a book. Because a film is a completely different experience. They're both brilliant pieces, they're both potentially brilliant pieces of storytelling, but they're very different kinds of storytelling. And you relate to them in a very different way. I think it, a book is a very personal thing, and especially if you love a book, then you own it in a way that you will never own a film, no matter how much you own, love that film. It will never be your f movie, the way that a book can be your book. So the very, I think we, we relate to books and films in a very different exp way, and I think the way books tell a story is very different from the way, I'm painfully aware, that the way a book tells a story is very different from the way a film tells a story. At the moment I'm working on uh, an adaptation of my books, Book Next Guide to Life, for DreamWorks and the level of work and skill that's involved in making that film is just, it's absolutely humbling, but it's very, very different, very much less personal, less lumpy, less amateurish than the book. And the book will always kind of be a bit amateurish because you're doing it on your own, but that is that there's something cherishable about that and there'll be, it'll be full of detail that a film will not be full of. And those are the things that I think make it very treasurable on a personal level. So I think film and books are, are both legitimate and both fantastically full of potential to be amazing, but they're really, really different and they, you can't use a film to substitute a book or to accelerate a kid through a book. I just don't think that's right. Should you always read the book before you watch the film? I don't know whether that's true, you see, because I think, you know, like, for instance, it, this might sound ridiculous, but in a way, in a lot of ways, I think the movies of, say, Lord of the Rings are better than the books in some sense, in that lots of the, the, the sort of turgid description that's in those Tolkien books becomes design and is brilliant and entrancing in a film. And it's, it's kind of re-amazes you that Tolkien had that in his head, that he had that whole world-making ability in his head that can seem quite dry when you're reading it. And I think if you watch the film, you kind of be, you might be alerted to how brilliant that, that really is, whereas as a reader coming to it straight, you might not be. And lots of films are just improvements on books. You know, like the Wizard of Oz film, it's in a different league from the Wizard of Oz book. It's so much better, so much cleaner. But at the same time, if you kind of came to the Wizard of Oz book after having seen the Wizard of Oz film, you'd have a kind of map of what, what is good about it. So I don't know, you can go from one to the other. What is the point of reading for pleasure? Oh my God, don't get me started. I think reading for pleasure is the, is the most 
important thing you can pass on because it so fortifies you as, a, as an adult. Like, nothing to do with education, nothing to do with becoming creative, but to do with being alive. You know, I think the ability to read for pleasure and to concentrate for long periods of time and the, that knowledge that it gives you of being able to leave the world for a little bit and, what, and how you share that with other people, these are deep, deep joys. And I think we get mixed up. I think because pleasure, especially for British people with their Protestant heritage, that pleasure has a kind of bad, uh, bad connotations as though pleasure is like fun or distraction. Pleasure is, pleasure is a really deep form of thinking. Pleasure is the most profound form of con concentration because pleasure is something that puts something in your brain and lets it stay in your brain maybe for your entire life and you will bring over the course of your life different things to bear on it, nostalgia and love and all these different things and it comes out and nobody knows where it comes out. You read a book for pleasure when you're a kid and it could come out when you're 50 as a bridge or um, a, a new form of bread. You don't know what it's going to be. That These things that stay in your mind for a long time and just enrich the landscape of your mind and when you grow up they could come out as like an ability to deal with a crisis, and a way to get through when your child is sick or a new way of solving an amazing problem in engineering. And that comes from reading as a kid. Eric the robot, I'm going to go back to Eric the robot. That's not a robot, that's a pretend robot. But nobody would ever have built real robots if people hadn't been playing at building robots. You know, these automata. Eric was an automata, he was driven by motors, he was worked by buttons and someone was speaking through him. But the vision of being able to do, the potential to do something like that comes out of the fun and the pleasure of playing with it. And I think that's what stories do. They give you these, these amazing potential uh, ideas that you can make come true in later life. I mean, one of the reasons I love writing children's books is that children's books only deal with big stuff. You get, I read lots of adult books that I really enjoy and they have a kind of surface darkness or a surface intellectualism and underneath there's nothing much that going on there that can be about quite trivial things really but spoken in a very profound way. Children's books are the opposite. All children's books are about death. <laughs> They're all about what is a human and what is life for and they all ask the big, big questions and that's um, what's attractive about to me about writing children's books and that is what is powerful about them when you're growing up you know you revert to them and we have maps the maps of what it could be to be a person come from c can come from the best children's literature you barely meet a woman of a certain generation who doesn't decide who she is by which one of the March sisters she identifies with uh, or which um, loads of people like you've you've had that anatomy of what a person can be from the hundred acre wood are you a tigger are you a heffalump are you a are you a, are you poo are you piglet and for me like the wizard of Etsy was definitely like that because that's a book about two different ways of knowing stuff and it felt like reading that book i was at some kind of moral crossroads in my life you know because that's sort of the project. I mean, the project for me, I think, is to notice things and to notice that life is good and worth fighting for. Uh, it's partly just that's my temperament and that's what I liked when I was reading. But I also kind of worry about this kind of, we've gone through a kind of period of like dystopia uh, and a, a kind of addiction to dystopia. And I worry that that's kind of moved the definition, definition of normal. Um, to into quite a dark place and like when politicians now do terrible things we kind of go well what do you expect that's what President Snow was like so why wouldn't you know not that that's not a brilliant book it is a brilliant book but I kind of think there is a place for someone saying life should be better than this you deserve better than this and you can do better than this and I feel very hopeful about um, young people you know we've just had this incident in London where our politicians were locked in a in Parliament, tearing lumps off each other about identity politics, about basically renegotiating a trade treaty, whereas outside young people were protesting about climate change. So the young people had a perspective on something huge and solvable and crucial and important while the grown-ups were in meltdown about who's in whose gang. <laughs>